Hey, take it away, guys. Thank you very much, Sottle and the ever-intelligent Firebat. I'm back at the desk, joined by Nathan, that's Admiral Zamora. It has been a fantastic day of play so far, and we are about to get underway with our second semi-final match, Neobility versus Silent Storm. It is an all-out Canadian grudge match, Admirable. Yes, and, and between two fantastic players at that note, Silent Storm re-emerging onto the scene this year has been just a pleasure to watch. When he won El the... Um, Legendary series for ESL. That was such a big breakout performance from him. And I think he's even improved a lot since that point. If his point total didn't tell you otherwise, uh, his play certainly can. And for Neobility, this was Frodan's pick to win the whole thing. And just what a season this guy's had. It's It almost seems like Neobility fell into the top eight in points rather than actually had it set as a goal for him. If that's any idea about how much this guy plays hard. He just did what he's always done and, and kept doing it, you know, as well as he's always done it. And you can see here 67 points from ladder finishes. He does have 10 points from majors, some open cups in there, and then five points from championships. He did, I believe, get a top 16 finish earlier this year in the Hearthstone Championship Tour. So really just an impressive run from him. And then here is Silent Storm, even more ladder points from Silent Storm, if that is, you know, even possible with how much new ability plays the game. Silent Storm plays just as much and just as well. A few open cups thrown in there and then five points from championships, but no majors for Silent Storm. Admirable, do you think that that could potentially hurt him in any way? Well, Silent Storm has always kind of seemed like the character who can get a little bit nervous when it comes to the big stage, when there's a lot at stake. And you'll notice that just from his tournaments and ch championships in general, his points are vast majority coming from ladder experiences, which is a very different environment from playing in a tournament like this one. So I think his performance that we saw was really spot on. I think there was a couple situations versus Frozen where the Warrior game could have been played a little bit more tightly, but for the most part, he was playing the game plan as it needed to be, which was actually apply a lot of pressure to Frozen once he didn't have the heal, and that meant Ankh and I couldn't be coupled with secret and, uh, I'm sorry, circle of healing and then the hero power to wipe out Twin Emperor Thorson. Uh, but overall, his play has just been fantastic. And playing against Neobility, this isn't a crazy lineup that's taking place. Mm -hmm. He should have a lot of practice versus this. And so I'm anticipating some in incredibly high level play where I think uh, just a few key cards here and there are really going to change things. Yeah, I mean, with the amount of knowledge that he showed about Frozen's lineup, which is one of the most unusual lineups we've ever seen, he definitely has the experience to combat a more typical lineup. And here we actually see some footage from the Toronto Fireside, where both of these guys are playing from. As you can see, Frodan and TJ in the background looking as dapper as ever. And soon, I assume, that will be replaced with us. I can only hope we look half as fly. <laughs> For, for a white guy, I don't, that's where I'm going to go with that one. But yeah, both of these guys <laughs> playing from Toronto. So uh, three of the eight total representatives were playing at the mm -hmm. Toronto location. And the, ha the fact that two of them are through to the semifinals, sad to see one of them go in this match. But at the end of the day, this tournament is about who triumphs. Absolutely, and one of these players will be making it through to the finals of this tournament, and then we'll get down to that. And one more player, the very last player of the Hearthstone Championship Tour, will be booking their ticket to the World Championship. So there is a ton on the line here for these guys. Admirable, both players so talented, so experienced. What would it mean for Neobility and Silent Storm to be able to make it to BlizzCon? Well, that's one of the big stamps on a player's resume is the World Championship. It is the pinnacle of Hearthstone competition. It's what they've worked all season to get to this point for. Uh, making it through to that point, obviously, is a tremendous breakout performance. And for the Canadian scene, I think this is such a big deal. Hot Form, I think, was a, an incredible thing for that scene. They saw their first major shortly afterwards. And, and having another representative there, I think, could just do wonderful things. Absolutely. Canada and the United States have been so evenly matched at some points as far as Hearthstone play and to see two Canadian representatives facing off against each other is going to be an exciting match for sure. So let's take a look at these bands real quick. Neobility has had his warrior band and Silent Storm has his shaman band and a lot of the time the most successful lineups coming in are ones that choose to ban shaman which just has a great win rate overall and then sort of soft target those warrior decks which seems to be a little bit of what Neobility is deciding to do here. Can you just walk us 
through his game plan? Well, a lot of it just revolves around having game plans that are very strong versus what Warrior's trying to do. And more specifically with Silent Storm's Cthulhu variation of this, I think there's more opportunity for Neo ability to actually sneak past some of the early defenses that we normally see control warriors put up. You know, There's not going to be a ton of early game removal, and they're fairly clunky threats at the end of the game. So if he manages to get a very aggressive start, it's pretty easy for him to steal a win here and there. Um, it's really interesting when you contrast that with Silent Storm's game plan mm -hmm. here, though, where he's left this, or, I'm sorry, where he's banned away the warrior. I feel like the Cthulhu variations of warrior are tend to be pretty strong in those matchups, but I don't feel like his warlock deck is really wanting to play that matchup at all. I mean, you're looking at a ton of removal in combination with Brawl. I feel like that's just an area he needs to avoid. And then also, if you are very versed in the Control Warrior matchups, there are some points and some opportunities where you can really pressure Cthune decks and take advantage of some of the minions they rely on in order to get mm -hmm. Cthune activators. So I think this is kind of an interesting take on what is an otherwise pretty close to a mirror match. Yeah, it's definitely very close. We see, obviously, the Warrior from Silent Storm and then the Shaman for Neobility, but Without bans, they would have had very nearly identical lineups. New ability also with the Hunter and Silent Storm with the Warlock. But the Zoo deck and the Hunter deck tend to do somewhat similar things. They like to gain early board pressure and then spiral the game out of control from there. So going to be really interesting to see how these two lineups match up against each other. We've got similar lineups. We've got two players from the same region, two players with such high skill who practice with each, with each other, who are playing in the same location. It is just going to be fantastic, admirable. I can't wait for it. It's kind of one of those bittersweet victories. When I was growing up playing cards, there was a ton of people that I practiced with and oftentimes had to face in tournaments, sometimes oh, yeah. in later stages. And you're, you're happy to see w one of the two of you win, but somewhere deep down inside, mm -hmm. you knew that you wanted to win yourself. But here we go. Game number one's getting underway. Silent Storm going to be on that Zoo Warlock and Neo Ability coming first with Shaman. And this is one that can get a little bit awkward for the zoo at times. We saw in the last series where BB Gun Gun was able to pick up a Wrath of Air Totem on a very timely turn for AoE, and that just cracked the game wide open. Yeah, that area of effect removal from the Shaman is really making this matchup much more even, whereas before, if it was the aggressive Shaman versus the Zoo, and the Zoo just gets an explosive start, a lot of the time the Shaman simply can't race. So now that it's a more mid-range build, you have Maelstrom Portal and usually two copies of Lightning Storm, uh, it's it's a much better matchup for the Shaman. Yeah, two copies of Lightning Storm indeed for Neo Ability, as well as those two Maelstrom Portals like you mentioned. Spirit Claws also can tend to do kind of a number in this deck. Now, Neo Ability has a much better bigger privilege here where he's just got the double totem golem opener which is one of the strongest starts that you can have it contests mm -hmm. malkazar's imp it's going to contest flame imp and it does all these things favorably i think the one big thing to look out for in this matchup is if silent storm can find an opportunity to take a big risk and try to get ahead on board i'm thinking somewhere in the neighborhood of silverware golem mm -hmm. maybe he can get a, a board uh, down to a reasonable size and try to rely on darkshire cancelman to deliver mm -hmm. massive damage or maybe he can just get a little bit tricky and find a favorable spot for crazed alchemist but outside of that it's not a very subtle strategy for him yeah crazed alchemist versus the mid-range shaman matchup is probably where this card shines best it is essentially a two mana kill a totem and it has two two worth of stats so it's really good it's also very flexible when combined with uh, we saw it with direwolf alpha earlier today to uh, boost one of the zoo warlocks minions so it's definitely a very flexible card very nice in this matchup and we've seen some soul fire into silverware golems that have also been working out very well for the zoo warlocks so far yeah unfortunately not for Noblor in the last series but uh, it's always a fantastic sight to see. Kind of touching on the Cruel Alchemist a little bit, its intended focus is is to wipe out Doomsayer in troublesome situations. But when the time comes and that card's not available, there are still plenty of options for Crazed Alchemist. It's just all around a fairly solid tech card. Absolutely. We've been seeing it more and more, and this is definitely one of the matchups where it will be most applicable. So going into turn number two, uh, Silent Storm, obviously, at a disadvantage with the Totem Golem on the board, needs to find some way to remove it while still pressuring by himself. And fortunately for him, Neobility is overloaded next turn, so he does not have anything as of now that he will be able to play. An interesting thing to note about that is prior to this, Shamans were very easy to, to coin into Totem Golem and then follow up with a Rockbiter weapon. And since Rockbiter weapon has changed to two mana, 
that's no longer a possibility. So defending this Totem Golem uh, is, is limited strictly to Lightning Bolt on that turn from Neobility. Outside of that, this Flame Imp is going to ensure that it can take it out. But that's just the beginning of it for Silent Storm. There's still plenty of action in Neobility's hand and a, and a recently added Spirit Claws. So my question kind of is, where does Silent Storm actually turn the corner and get aggressive in this matchup? Because when you're limited by the AoE and you're having to fight against this mm -hmm. strong of an opener, it can be really tough. It's definitely going to be very difficult. While the new discard mechanics have given the Warlock a way to sort of keep up the hand size to be able to put persistent pressure on their opponent, if they don't get those discard mechanics, then cards like Malkazar's Imp are just a one mana one three, whereas they used to be a sea giant in many cases, which was just much better for pressure, obviously, a much larger minion. So in this case, you're going for a larger hand size, but if you don't have that, then a lot of the time you're going to be stuck with some smaller minions that might not get you as far. Yeah, and this play right here I love from Silent Storm. He kind of recognizes that Power Overwhelming isn't going to get a ton of value this game. It is a very valuable card in this matchup, mostly for trading over Thing from Below or just delivering burst damage. But in this spot, this Flame Imp and the Dark Peddler are worth a ton. And Neobility, without this Feral Spirit draw, actually might have been in a bit of trouble in this spot. Now, this does set him up for the Totem Golem next turn and kind of bringing his open all together at this mm -hmm. point. But Silent Storm, with a freshly picked up Knife Juggler, suddenly has options to even work around that. So this is will chew into his board a bit. But this next turn or two is really going to decide where Silent Storm sits in this game. Yeah, Neobility is looking to curve out reasonably well after this Totem Golem coming on the following turn, and then he can follow that up with Flame, Le Flame Wreath Faceless on, uh, on turn five for him. He'll be at four mana. So Neobility is not hurting for a curve right now, and Silent Storm, his board is just going to be a little bit weak after these trades, and he's pretty reliant on one of these knives hitting a wolf right now. Yeah, this is an interesting pickup as well where... Uh, he's going to end up taking Lowly Squire, but I do think there is some consideration for the corruption in this matchup. A lot of times you'll find yourself facing a thing from below or a Flame Wreath Faceless, and there's not really a favorable trade into it, and you don't want to invest your entire board position. So what you can do sometimes is forego dealing any damage, throw corruption on the target, and hope that at the end of the day it just succeeds. Absolutely, and of course we know that Neobility has that Flame Wreath Faceless in hand. The corruption would have been pretty nice. But in this case, Silent Storm just believes that that Lowly Squire is going to be better. And it's not bad. I mean, obviously, the Zoo Warlock is going to be hero powering as often as they can to be able to assure that larger hand size and that consistent stream of pressure. And Silent Storm picks up that crazed Alchemist. Could actually help him get a nice clear on the Totem Golem with a favorable knife juggle. This is an interesting spot here where Silent Storm definitely needs to begin considering what his card economy looks like. And. Life Tap is certainly on the menu this turn. I mean, he took the Lowly Squire sort of anticipation of using hero powers. So in this particular spot, how much can he can he really get by with this? You know, maybe the fact that Neo Ability just took two damage there to set up a kill on the Knife Juggler says to Silent Storm that he can start making a push here. And if that's the case, I'm kind of eyeing the Crazed Alchemist to maybe protect the Knife Juggler from getting hit by the Spirit Claws again and just push damage. This is a really crazy spot where there's a ton of stuff Silent Storm could do, even though he's pretty limited on options. Yeah, I see where you're going with that. And at the same time, I mean, obviously you want your Knife Juggler to be around as long as possible. Even with a 2-2 stat line, it's still an incredible resource to have on board. And I think with the second, with the pickup of that second knife juggler, Silent Storm is that actually really going to buy. double trade. Okay, I, I'm i curious how he manages to come back onto board after this. Well, his concern was clearly the totem golem wiping out the second knife juggler here. And I'm not sure he spotted the crazed alchemist onto it, but wow, that is, okay, well, just halt the presses right there. That is an enormous draw for Silent Storm right now. Yeah, he's going to be able to play the Doom Guard, clear the thing from below off the board, and you can put down the Lowly Squire before it just to have something else on the board as well. His major question is, is digging deeper into my deck worth more than having a Lowly Squire out right now? Because he's got Malkazar's Imp, if he discards cards, he gets to draw from it instead. So say he picks up Soulfire 
off of this Doom Guard by discarding mm -hmm. or power overwhelming. Those are cards that'll help him push through this and keep the Doom Guard healthy. Ideally, rolling into Neo ability six mana turn, he's not vulnerable to Fire Elemental on the Doom Guard side. So I actually like that he's chosen to just discard the Lowly Squire. There's tons of one cost cards he can pick up anyway, and it ends up benefiting him in the times when he draws those extra that extra four damage to push through this thing from below. Yeah, this is fantastic. It is going to leave him vulnerable to area of effect damage, Lightning Storm in particular. But I feel like if you have any chance of winning this matchup, you just really can't play around it in a lot of cases. Yeah, this certainly isn't one of them. At this point, Silent Storm has to throw caution to the wind and hope that the area of effect damage isn't there, which it's not. And so when he sees this Fire Elemental, this is sort of a glimpse of hope for Silent Storm at this point where now certainly he's going to be pushing damage and is this enough to get the job done? Oh, it's looking like it's getting even better. That Soulfire can discard Silverware Golem and depending on where this knife goes, he might want to clear out the Fire Elemental, but honestly, it looks like that's going into a Void Walker. I think it's time for face. I, I think you I think you do hit the Fire Elemental when you juggle it here. And when you don't juggle it, you certainly consider what it looks like if you just decide mm -hmm. to push. Um, in this spot, I don't think that the lack of pushing actually increased the time to kill. I think it was two turns regardless. But it certainly might not be two turns if there's any disruption from Neo Ability's side. But either way, with no AoE in hand, Silent Storms is looking primed to take game one. Yeah, you have to keep that disruption in mind. But as he hasn't seen any AoE removal thus far, you can't be, you know, as we said, playing around it entirely. And Neo Ability still doesn't have any in hand. Flame Wreath Faceless looking like a fantastic card on paper, but now we're kind of seeing why it's been rotating out of the meta a little bit. It's really just very clunky in this hand. It's not quite aimed at this matchup. This is certainly one where it struggles. Uh, but Neo Ability, kind of a victim of, of the draw, honestly, here. His two Totem Golems didn't quite get the value he wanted. I think Silent Storm navigated it excellently. And then the Timely Doom Guard draw, you know, I mentioned it. I think that timely draws were really going to be one of the big factors in this match because, frankly, they're very evenly matched. All right, Neo Ability at seven, three, four, five on board for Silent Storm. He just needs two damage to close out this game. Yeah, single damage, actually. There's there's six. Oh, oh I do mixed it. a Void Walker. Yep. My eyes literally just saw three frogs, but nope, one of those had one attack, and that is going to be game number one for Silent Storm. Really navigating a matchup that doesn't seem all that fantastic nowadays extraordinarily well. It's pretty straightforward, to be perfectly honest, but the thing about it is it's really difficult at times to pull the trigger on that. Mm -hmm. When you're facing down a lot of potential AoE, you'll find players want to be very conservative. The fact that Silent Storm went, yeah, he's got those cards, I'm probably just going to lose anyway. That's the way to play that matchup. And it worked out for him in the end. We'll be right back with game number two right after this. Silent Storm taking the win on the back of his discard Warlock deck, taking a rather unusual approach. It's not the most unusual, but instead of banning the Shaman, he decided to ban Warrior and then picked up a really nice win with that Warlock early on. Yeah, it's a very critical win at that. That's a tough matchup when you're playing against Shaman. If there's a lot of AoE on the other side, you're probably going to struggle. But if there's not a ton of AoE, you can slip past some wins, and, and getting the first one here is really critical because I think his Zoo deck could have struggled versus some of else of what Neo abilities brought. So to get that locked away early, I think is a, a sizable advantage for him at this point. Game number two is going to be Silent Storm's Tempo Mage matching up against Neo Ability's Mid-Range Hunter. And you see that Faceless Summoner in Silent Storm's list. Pavel brought a Tempo Mage list that had Water Elementals and Faceless Summoners in it to the European last call, and it performed incredibly well for him. And then in Neo Ability's list, we're seeing that injured Kval Deer. So how did these decks line up, Admirable? This is a really interesting uh, situation for Neo Ability where this is not the matchup you're looking for when you have Desert Camel in your deck. Mm -hmm. That card's going to pull a one drop from either player's deck, which means that from um, Silent Storm's side could potentially pull Mana Worm. If he doesn't have a way on board to check that immediately, it often means that Silent Storm gets the attacker's advantage from Desert Camel, which is, can be a big punish. But the thing that's really interesting to note about this one, I'd say, is the way that this Tempo Mage is built. It's got a, it's a much heavier than normal, and there's an Arc Mage Antonitis in addition 
to the face of Summoners and the Ragnaros that's at the top end. So if Silent Storm doesn't get off to an early start, sometimes he's just done. So the fact that he's got some early things here, I think is really key to it. Without this, he could very easily be pushed out of this game. There are no babbling books in this list. That's been very common up until now, and no Acolyte of Pains. So it seems to be taking kind of a middle ground between the very aggressive list that runs babbling book and the more minion-oriented list, uh, like the one that Pavel was running. So how do you think that this matches up? I mean, he, he really would rather have, I think, that removal in this case. It certainly sometimes is the case. I mean, ha having Archmage and Faceless and uh, Faceless Summoner this early is definitely a liability. It's greatly restricting his options at this point. Even on this turn, honestly, the Fireball is not looking so bad here, but look at the way the rest of his turns pan out. The coin is pretty critical when you're playing this many endgame drops. A lot of times you just have one of them and you have to accelerate to it in any way that you can. But in this particular situation, Definitely doesn't want to play the Flame Waker, I don't think. It's pretty vulnerable on board. If he doesn't kill the Leoch, it's wiping out his Mana Worm. It's threatening Houndmaster. Everything here spells the Fireball, but this particular hand is how this deck gets punished for it. The Fireball's okay, obviously. It removes the Leoch, which is a threat that you have to take care of, even if it's not the scariest animal companion. And it bumps that Mana Worm up to three attack, which means that it's a priority threat now that Neobility has to take care of. Otherwise, it will trade with more of his minions. So it'll likely draw out some removal, which is not bad as well as removing the Leoch itself. But you hit the nail on the head going into the next couple of turns. Silent Storm has a pretty awkward looking hand. Yeah, this Eagle Horn Bow is a great pickup for Neobility as well. It allowed him to very cleanly check the Mana Worm without having to expend a kill command or send Infested Wolf out into the fray and hope that it somehow survives through the turn. And that'll be Silent Storm's key to play Flame Waker which Neobility then picks up another interesting draw to add alongside of it. And suddenly Silent Storm's hand is looking a little bit better because Neobility had a turn or so where he stumbled here a bit. Yeah, Neobility is going to want to remove this Flame Waker. Deadly Shot is looking like a nice option, really the only way, uh, unless he wants to use the Kill Command and combine it with the Eagle Horn Bow. That just seems a little bit weaker. Uh, it's kind of rare that you get exactly what you want from a Deadly Shot, so I think that's slated for now, but he doesn't have any follow-up after it. So if Silent Storm can pick up something to capitalize on that bit of a misstep from Neobility, he's definitely going to be in a much better position. The only issue with Deadly Shotting here is the top end from Silent Storm. With the addition of Archmage, there's a Ragnaros, and there's Faceless Summoner. It may be a little bit difficult to take care of board states at times, but I think I'm in agreement with you here. Barnes is way too risky. The Infested Wolf isn't quite as risky. I could, I'm could, i totally fine with this, but Silent Storm oftentimes will have ways to punish a turn just like this one. And just fortunately for Neobility, he doesn't have that. Yeah, Frostbolt or Forgotten Torch, which is in the list, would have matched up with this Infested Wolf really nice. But fortunately for Silent Storm, he picks up a playable card off the top, the Azure Drake, exactly what you want to see on turn five. Now, this could be the turns where Neobility starts to run into a little bit of trouble, where if he continues to pick up early game cards, it's very likely Silent Storm can just scale through his curve and not think too much of this. Faceless Summoner provides a lot of value versus Hunter. The Flame Strike presents a lot of recovery options. Firelands Portal, just more value. Everything in his deck is just value at this point. And so it's smart of Neobility to start launching that assault right now, because if he doesn't start pushing damage, Silent Storm's going to have a comfortable life total to just start plowing out endgame threats. At the same time, though, Neobility has now expended one kill command, which means he only has one left in the deck. Quick Shot does represent more damage, and obviously the Hunter Hero Power is a natural-born killer. So while he is a little bit limited, the more minion pressure that he can put on, the better. And Silent Storm throws down that Faceless Summoner. Kieran Tor Mage uh, is pretty applicable in this situation. It is the Mage class, after all. It's not something you usually see. Wow. And that Savannah High Main from Barnes wow. is what can really swing this even further into the Hunter favor. It definitely can, but Neobility has to consider what trades look like at this point. And honestly, I'm looking more at that Huffer than I am looking at the Infested Wolf. Mm -hmm. If he runs into Flame Strike, he is going to get wiped out of this game. Now, that is a single copy of Flamestrike that's in Silent Storm's deck. 
and I don't think Neobility has the liberty to play around that and then end up in a favorable spot. And so if he is thinking kind of the way that I'm thinking if I was in his position, I need to push damage and I need to push it now, it is going to be a catastrophe. I think very wise of him to use the Eagle Horn bow to take out the Kirin Tormage here to further prevent catastrophe. But either way, this is going to be very painful for Neobility. Silent Storm can clear off this board, leave just two 1-1 one, one minions behind, and then Neobility is down to one card in hand and one card on draw. From that point, Silent Storm has a much better hand with very high quality removal spells and the Arc Mage, which he can use to close out this game. Now, he does have some quality draws that follow up, if that's the case. He's got Hound Masters, he's got a Stranglethorn Tiger, there's Savannah High Main, there's Ragnaros, there's Call of the Wild. Only Call of the Wild won't be able to be accessed next turn. But maybe Silent Storm's got different options here. Maybe he doesn't feel like he needs to Flame Strike. We saw him kind of consider the, the Firelands Portal, which I don't think is unreasonable. If he traded into Bards and Firelands Portaled the Huffer, he could follow up with the Flame Strike afterwards, maybe even be more devastating. But is that? are you willing to take this much damage in order to get that done? I mean, Silent Storm's at 17 health. If you're willing to leave four on board, you're certainly building up a more threatening board for yourself, but the Hunter can deal a ton of damage very fast, so it's definitely just safer to go ahead and play the Flame Strike here. You're still at board advantage, and Neobility only has two cards in hand. Huge That's Toad is not the best pickup here. Neobility is running a an interesting higher curve, but he only does have one copy of Call of the Wild. Yeah, I mean, after this, he is out of gas. It's it. I think Sil oh my with that with that draw Silent Storm can certainly handle this board pressure but it's a matter of just which way does it best just a fantastic t uh, turnout for Silent Storm who for all intents and purposes had a pretty weak opening hand very heavy which is what you would expect to be punished by the hunter especially in this matchup but Neobility's draws just didn't line up too well and that flame strike was very very punishing so Silent Storm can clear off the largest minions on board. Those 1-1s one -ones are not threatening enough. And with a fireball to yep. face, he has put Neobility that in is, check. That is the perfect setup. That is exactly the outcome that Silent Storm wanted. Houndmaster, it's nice to draw at this point, but it's not enough. Silent Storm is going to take a 2-0 lead here as he navigates this matchup and finds a hyper large value flame strike. Yeah, this has just been a an incredibly fast match so far, uh, especially with this Tempo Mage. Obviously, it's a quick deck, so is the Warlock, but just navigating so well so far and really, really showing why he deserves to be here. Yeah, Neobility considering the difference between Frostbolt and other burn spells. Obviously, most of the other burn spells kill him besides yeah. Arcane Missiles, which at this point he's seen both copies. Forgotten Torch won't kill him either. But if it's Firelands Portal or Fireball, he's dead. So if it's one of the other two and he trades in both minions, he does have some draws that will win him the game afterwards. And the fact that Neobility is even thinking that deeply about this is just, just speaking volumes for the kinds of players we're watching. So what's more likely for him, that Silent Storm has that Frostbolt or Forgotten Torch and then is able to kill with the Faceless Summoner? And he, he bets that it's less likely that he has the Frostbolt. Uh, unfortunately for him, he, Silent Storm does have the Firelands portal and is able to close out this game. With one Fireball having been seen already, it's great that he was taking the time to do that, but Silent Storm just having all of the cards he really needed going into that later game. Yeah, at that point, he's just got to hope that the hand is dead for for Silent Storm at that point. That's very difficult. The deck is loaded with burn spells. And the cards that aren't burn spells are typically cards that draw more burn yeah, spells. So more minions <laughs> that make the burn spells cheaper or right. do more damage. And uh, I, that, that Tempo Mage is very strong. I feel like Tempo Mage has been a bit on the back burner for a while now. It hasn't been seen as often as you know something like the Midrange Hunter, for example. But when you're bringing a five deck lineup, the Tempo Mage is a great option. And here it worked out for him really well. So Silent Storm picking up his second win of the match has the Druid and the Warrior left to win the series. And these are two incredibly consistent decks. Yep, 2-0 lead at this point is, is halfway there through this series now. That's kind of where I think Neobility is sitting in, though, is that the Warrior build and the Druid builds are, are kind of a soft target for him. These aren't quite the all-in style where you're trying to target them very hard, but a lot of these are very favorable matches. 
Uh, so I'm curious to see exactly how Silent Storm ends up taking them on. I would venture to say the players who came into this event weren't quite expecting the Cthune Control Warrior builds. Yeah. And since that's the build from Silent Storm, this may be a little bit of trouble when you're trying to figure out how to navigate that matchup in particular. Yeah, the Hunter generally targets the Warrior very, very well. But against the Cthune Control Warrior, you have cards like Ancient Shield Bear, which can extend the Warrior's life even more. And it just is a little bit messier. They've got more early game, more mid-range minions, which can make it a bit more difficult. The Hunter is still favored. I think it definitely will still go in the Hunter's way most of the time. But with the Cthune Control Warrior on board, it's not quite as obvious. However, we are not going to be seeing that just yet. Neobility is going to queue up with that Shaman once again, and Silent Storm going into his Druid deck. Yeah, and this Druid deck isn't quite like the others we've seen. It is the Malagos variety, obviously with Arcane Giants at the top end, but he does have a copy of Sylvanas. He's got a copy of Ancient of War. There are two Moonglade portals in this build. There are some choices in here that very much reflect the personality of Silent Storm, where he prefers these more top-end copies that have, at times, very high impacts. So it's always interesting to watch his take on these things. And as we roll into this matchup, Neobility once again has a fantastic Shaman start, but last time we saw this, it didn't get the job done. Starfall for Silent Storm would be a fantastic pickup. Not useful until later in the game, but when Neobility builds up a large board that has totems and maybe a Thunderbluff Valiant on it. The Starfall can certainly do that AoE damage or even just a thing from below. It can be single target removal. It's very flexible. I can't imagine that Astral Communion is the pick here. No, certainly not. I mean, he's already got Wrath in hand. He's got Arcane Giant. The deck isn't quite dense enough at the top end to justify an Astral <laughs> Communion, I'd say. Um, I, I couldn't blame him for taking, because this does have an Innervate, but that's an awfully ambitious game plan. Yeah, definitely Starfall more consistent here. Claw has a place in time, I believe, but Silent Storm thinking into the later game. Wow. That is a snap wild growth off the top, and I can't blame him. I don't think I've ever seen a wild growth played that fast. We saw the played it animation before, before we, saw we saw the, the draw, draw it animation. Draw it animation. Yeah, and that's what, that's what happens when you play that fast, Silent Storm. Now there's a secret card. Uh, it cannot be played, meaning it's above four mana. And we're getting a nice view of the card back, which we don't usually get. It is a nice view of the card back. Kinda it's a nice looking card back. I kind of wish I could look at him that way a little bit more. Mm. It's usually my opponents who see him. Yeah. And then I just see my opponent's card backs. Yeah, I never like theirs. Hey, he's, he's using <laughs> the Dollar on Flame card back. That's a nice card back. It's a very nice card. I have uh, some intel that you're going to be coming into that card back yourself I pretty soon. Cast a lot of tests, bud. I hope so. But. <laughs> Uh, here, here we are on this turn where the power of Tunnel Trog is certainly showing his teeth right now. This is the uh, Silent Storm chose to answer the Totem Golem, and I think wisely so, but Tunnel Trog does present a lot of value if Neobility is able to overload properly, and this is certainly one of those situations for it. But Azure Drake is a great pickup for Silent Storm. It's just going to get squashed. This is the point where Neobility is hoping to snowball the game. And this is kind of what I was talking about with the soft target. If he gets a great opening hand, he will be able to apply a ton of pressure to Silent Storm. Neobility spiraling this game quickly out of control for Silent Storm. And he can delay a little bit longer. That Moonglade portal potentially could bring up a taunt that could, you know, rebuff some of that damage. Kidnapper, not what he's looking for here. Yeah, honestly, I think one of the best ones he could have gotten here is is Archmage, which would have given okay, him an extra yeah. spell damage for Starfall in the next turn. I, I, and that think is what he was going for with the Azure Drake, hoping mm -hmm. that the ability would just push damage instead of try to take care of it and open that window of opportunity for him. The ability sniffed that out, but here, I, I, I feel like Kidnapper is just not nearly enough. There's the ability has so many ways to either just ignore it or take care of it. It's really the balls in his court right now. Neobility with nine on board, six in hand from the Lightning Bolts with a hero power that's a potential for eight. Just puts him a couple points off of lethal this turn, and Silent Storm needs to secure this board back for himself in the following turn, or it is going to be all over. Uh, Neobility taking kind of a middle ground and trading into that kidnapper. You can't fault him for it. It would allow Silent Storm to clean up the board, and it would allow him to trade into this thing from below. So I think if he wants to play the thing from below, that trade is definitely warranted. Yeah, and Starfall 
once again, kind of in an awkward spot where ideally it's coupled with spell power to take care of a wide board position, but it does pull five power off the board here. My major concern is just for his, oh, oh, I didn't see this option. The Innervate Swipe. This is actually way better. Ignore everything I just said. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be a full board clear. He decides to go for the two damage on all minions. Innervate Swipe cleans it up. And Silent Storm has a second Moonglade portal in deck as well as Feral Rage in hand. So he has quite a bit of health to potentially wrestle this game back. Yeah, this is a very large play for Neo Ability still. Fire Elemental, just anything this sized is kind of awkward for for the Druid to really handle. And since he just saw a lot of removal, it's a pretty easy play for him. Now the one detriment is the two Lightning Storms in hand. Those are very unlikely to get significant value this game. But if Neo Ability can draw anything to start pushing more damage, this could be the end of the game very soon. I'm thinking somewhere in the neighborhood of Ragnaros, maybe a hex for a large mm -hmm. threat. Uh, you know, I get the sense that Neo Ability is a bit uncomfortable in this spot because Silent Storm still has quite a few plays that could that could shut this assault down. Those lightning storms really good against the Druid if that Druid is running Violet Teachers. That set is very weak to a spell boosted lightning storm or both lightning storms, which can clear board really nicely. But Silent Storm not running those wide board pieces, instead opting for some later game like the Sylvanas, the two copies of Moonglade Portal, and that Ragnaros. So going into these later turns, if he's able to stabilize it will swing into his favor, especially looking at Neo Ability's weak hand. Yeah, the one ones here is, is kind of interesting to me. I'm curious what the function of these are, other than maybe top decking a Wrath or trying to handle a Taunt Totem. But uh, the Arcane Giant here, certainly the threat he wants out and, and try to start either cleaning up the board or, or finding some sort of pressure. But I'm not quite sure about the, about the saplings here. Feels a little bit out of place. It, it, you know, almost like... If he drew Malagos, maybe he has a way to actually swing the board back in his favor. But it's it's looking pretty slim right now. When you're staring at an opponent's hand of four cards and you know they're drawing a fifth, yeah. I'm thinking Silent Storm isn't really happy about his position. Yeah, the Sapling's not necessary for Silent Storm to play the Arcane Giant this turn. So I suppose just trying to get a wider board presence, wanting to be able to try and remove what new ability plays this turn. Uh, unfortunately, they're just going to be cut down really quickly by that Lightning Storm. Yeah, but the Lightning Bolt's here to clean up the Arcane Giant. is totally fine for Neo Ability. His number one goal right now, since he drew Thunder Bluff Valiant, is to find an opportunity to unlock that potential. That's going to require him to Hero Power a couple times and also have a clean board position. Uh, so I think this is... That pickup for Neo Ability is really important in this spot. Silent Storm's going to reload but it is not the strongest. Meyer Keeper and of course Moonglade Portal welcomed, but Neo Ability I, I still think is in full control right now. I really like that double lightning bolt from Neo Ability. He was on the burn plan before Silent Storm had used Feral Rage and Moonglade Portal to heal, but now that Silent Storm was at a more comfortable life total, Neo Ability felt like he was going to get more damage from the minion over the long run, and I think that is going to work out pretty well for him. Another Excellent look at a card back. And uh, Flame Tongue Totem was played. You can't see it, unfortunately. A new ability going even further into the defensive play by trading that Fire Elemental into the Mire Keeper. Admirable, yeah. why do you think he did that? At this point, he's just playing a grind game. If he can protect the totems for a single turn, that's going to be an opportunity for Thunder Bluff Valiant. And so here, yes, he could have pushed a massive amount of damage. And honestly, that still may have been right. But being able to set up a board position where you are threatening the end of the game is still very powerful. It does force still removal from Silent Storm. Uh, this, uh, this wipes out potential for, for any heal shenanigans to maybe buy Silent Storm the time he needs or a Malagos with double Moonfire to sweep it up. Uh, but either way, Silent Storm between a rock and a hard place. I, it's hard to find a situation where he's coming out super far ahead of this one. Well, this turn he can clear the board if he chooses. He decides that that is not going to win him the game and instead is going to play that Moonblade portal, clear off the Fire Elemental, run into the Searing Totem and leave the Flame Tongue on the board. Essentially, this develops the Wind Fury Harpy in exchange for leaving the Flame Tongue on the board. I think this is fantastic for him, actually. And that role is actually really important in this spot because if Neo Ability has anything to add to pressure here, the swipe alone isn't going to clean it up. But with the Wind Fury Harpy, he has two opportunities to attack with that. And Neo Ability's not killing that this turn unless he's going to feel an awful lot of gusto with this Lightning Storm yeah. somehow. It's uh, 
Silent Storm is on the verge of actually bringing this game back. And when you look at the draw density, it is very much in Silent Storm's favor. Step number one is going to be handling the Thunder Bluff Valiant. Good positioning from Neobility. Throws the totem on the opposite side of the Flame Tongue. Would put a taunt totem uh, really nicely there. Silent Storm picks up that Malagos. It's good as far as the body. It can't be easily removed except for Hex. But right now, I, I feel like there's a swipe in line for this turn. You need to remove this board. Well, honestly, I think that Neobility is from Silent Storm's perspective, it, I think you can eliminate Hex from the range. We That card has been in hand since the Arcane Giant hit. And on the Arcane Giant turn, we saw two uh, Lightning Bolts rather than a Hex. And from Silent Storm's perspective, that may mean that he can play Malagos and look for Swipe to clean up the board next turn, which would require him attacking the Flame Tongue Totem and then attacking over the Totem Golem. If that's the case, right now, that succeeds. So do you think that he's... I mean, do you ever feel comfortable leaving a Thunder Bluff Valiant on board? You're at 15 health, so it's it's certainly not that low of a health total, but that card is a huge threat. I, I don't know if he's got an option here. I mean, this is the win condition right now, is land the swipe in combination with Malagos. Silent Storm deciding if he wants to get a little greedy and run into that spell power totem, decides to clear the Totem Golem oh, instead. That's a big draw for All the right, ability so right now. Spirit Claws is three. And then he's got three from the Tusk or he, from the Thunder Bluff Valiant. He absolutely can clear it this turn, and it's it's partially in thanks to that Spirit Claw. Mm -hmm. uh, without it, he would have needed an, an another source of damage this turn. It was it was seven sitting on board, and then a maximum of four from Lightning Storm. It would have yep. left Malagos at one. But with that Spirit Claws instead, very able to clear it, and that is a huge check mark for Neobility at this point because if that Malagos lived, it was bye bye to the board. All right, the board is gone for Silent Storm, but with that wild growth and the swipe, he's going to be able to... Oh, Innervate's a terrible draw. That's the worst draw in the deck by far. He's got to pick up something with the excess mana, but if he wants to clear this board, it's... Oh, that's my gosh. just awful. And the facial expression from Silent Storm says it all in this spot. Those are literally back-to-back -back two of the worst draws in the deck. He just gave up his Malagos, which I think will rightfully so. Um, but unfortunately, that means he's not going to be able to combo it with that Moonfire. Yeah, I think without a doubt it was the right uh, choice for him. I think it was very clear he could conclude there was no Hex in, in the ability's hand. But Feral Spirit off the top is going to start launching the Assault again. Silent Storm, that's a good pickup. That will certainly buy him some much-needed time. Exactly what he needs. Neobility still has Hex in deck. If he can pick one up here, that would be a huge draw. Yeah, there's a couple of really strong ones here still. Another Thunder Bluff Valiant would be great. A Hex would be very strong. Even a Mana Tide Totem, I think, would, could be enough to turn the tables at this point. And there's also Ragnaros at the top end. That's been a very popular choice at this tournament. But Silent Storm, if he draws Nourish, or he draws Sylvanas, or he draws Ragnaros, or he draws Arcane Giant, mm -hmm. those are all very large pickups right now. Even an Azure Drake would be a fantastic one for him. And neither of those are found, but a consolation prize with five extra points of power. My Keeper's not terrible, and Neobility goes for the two-turn kill on the Ancient of War, decides to hit with the Spirit Claws, and deciding that he's likely going to have to invest a good chunk of his health if he wants to kill this minion, not relying on the Hex off of the top. Oh my gosh. It's another weak draw. Well, two weak draws from Silent Storm and then two weak draws from Neobility. It's certainly turned into Silent Storm's favor. And when you get to this stage, honestly, these two decks don't have that difference of a draw density. I would say that Silent Storm's threats are a little bit more powerful and more impactful. And Azure Drake is certainly one of those impactful ones. I think Silent Storm's crawling back into this game. When both decks have weak draws, the deck that can draw more is usually in a better situation. And in this case, it's just the Druid. Double Nourish, that Wrath for Cycle, potentially just gives Silent Storm a much larger potential to draw into those threats. So Something now else. Neobility's in a really bad position. The other thing to look at too, oh my, is how much damage he could push. Without an Arcane Giant, could he have set up a turn where Neobility's under the threat of lethal? It certainly is now, and Neobility, I don't know how on earth he gets out of this, but Silent Storm has completely turned the game around from what was looking like 
a tough position. And a lot of the time we see these turnarounds come very dramatically, but this was one that sort of happened slowly but surely for Silent Storm. He's been fighting back from Neobility's aggression this entire game and just capitalized on a series of weak turns from Neobility, was able to get his own stronger draws and just turn this game completely in his favor. Yeah, that's not the shot Neobility needed to live. And so Silent Storm takes game three and is now on match point. The threat of a 4-0 here and he's got kind of one of his signature decks with Cthune Druid. This is what he played at uh, at America's prelims mm -hmm. to a very effective finish. This this is looking like with four tries that I, I, I'm not. I'm so glad I'm not in Neo ability spot, spot because th this is this is massive three zero. Silent Storm going up three zero not only in this series but in his previous one as well. So just a dominant showing so far. And right after this, we'll be back into game number five to see if Silent Storm can take it all the way. Silent Storm up 3-0 in semifinal number two. Going into game number four, he has a chance to close this match out with a solid 4-0 if he wins this game. And what a performance that would be. Now, the rest of the deck lineup for Neobility is a bit different. These are where he starts to enter these matchups that are fairly favorable for him. But having to win four straight, they have to be very favorable to win four in a row. Even if he had all 65% matchups across the rest of the board, he would still be unfavored to win the series from this point. Well, we saw Frozen go with this same strategy somewhat, where he just lost very quickly to Silent Storm's first three matches and then tried to counter this warrior deck. And even the anti-warrior control priest couldn't get the job done versus the Cthulhu warrior. Yeah, I think Firebat put it really well, where uh, he said Neobility didn't go full Frozen. But <laughs> in this spot, it is you know, maybe he was kind of wishing he did because this is an uphill task. Now, Desert Camel is one of the features of this particular Hunter deck that is going to put a lot of pressure on Silent Storm. The fact that he gets to pull out an injured Cavaldier or a Fiery Bat, there are no one-cost minions in Silent Storm's Cthune Warrior build, and rightfully so. There are none that are strong that fit in here, and so Desert Camel just gets massive value. Did Firebat get to cast a Fiery Bat earlier today? We we, we alluded to it, but Aww. fortunately it wasn't so. Well, maybe we'll be lucky. Who knows? Well, for Neobility's sake, uh, he's going to need that injured Cavaldier. And Deadly Shot, I think, is incredibly smart here for Neobility. Don't give Silent Storm the extra draws. A lot of times the Cthune Control Warrior decks operate on a very greedy curve. So if Silent Storm doesn't have a lot of early game tools, denying draws could potentially lead to a snowball effect for Neobility, where his threats just go unchecked for basically the entire game. And the Cavaldier picked up for Neobility, meaning that that Desert Camel can now only get Fiery Bat. Still good, but when you put it in the deck, you want those Cavaldiers to come out as two fours. Yeah, if, imagine if it was just drawn in the other order. It would yeah. be, it'd be much more, you'd have an extra three health to work with. And Silent Storm, no lack of early game tools. So far for him, it's been all golden. It's just everything he needs. And Silent Storm chose to play the Ravaging Ghoul to kill off the first Cavaldier. Seemed pretty good, still was really so good. Uh, but now Neobility has two one man or two one health minions, excuse me, on board that Silent Storm's going to have to trade into somehow. He's got the Disciple and the War Axe, but it's it's gonna be a little bit more difficult this turn. Definitely is. Another whirlwind style effect with either Revenge or Ravaging Ghoul Maybe. would be would be fantastic for him, but in this spot, it's I don't think it's an it's enough to be a clean kill, but cleaning up the board is just step number one. He's got to find a way to rustle control, and it's got to be in a relatively clean fashion. So I'm, I think he's going to choose to isolate the injured Cavaldier. No, he leaves it up. This this is interesting to me. I guess Houndmaster isn't that big of a deal on this board. And I guess you wouldn't play your Disciple first if you were going to kill the Fiery Bat afterwards. And fortunately for Silent Storm, the 50-50 does miss the Disciple there. But I, I think I would have liked seeing the Cavaldier left up 
I just because of the potential for the Houndmaster buff? He could have just very easily killed the Fiery Bat first and avoided mm -hmm. any potential uh, to hit the Disciple of Cthune. Well, worked out okay for Silent Storm in the end. <laughs> Indeed it did. Infested Wolf, not the strongest of reloads, and Neo ability very much valuing the coin to try and access an early Ragnaros, but Silent Storm has kind of weathered the storm at this point. <laughs> And he's going to be looking to make massive plays. He's got it. He's got Cthulhu already at 10 power, and when he for when he draws Ancient Shield Bearer and Twin Emperor Vecklor, it looks like he's going to be able to take board Ooh. with the Sylvanas. Sylvanas is a massive threat in this spot since Neobility's one minion always leaves something behind. So there's not a tremendous trade option for him. I and and honestly, I think counters. I think uh, Silent Storm just counter attacks in this spot, and that sometimes it's successful. Yeah, Silent Storm. Weighing his options there, Cthulhu's Chosen is not bad in this situation, but the Sylvanas just pretty much ensures that you're going to have board and makes this high main draw so awkward for Neobility. And this is exactly the situation that Silent Storm needed to be in in this Hunter matchup. If he finds himself rolling into Neobility's turn where Savannah high main's hitting the board before Silent Storm has proactive threats, it doesn't work very well for him. But when he's able to land Sylvanas, it's a completely different story. How does Neobility get past this point favorably? Well, he's going to have to make some pretty awful trades if he doesn't want to give up that infested wolf to the Sylvanas, but... I, I mean, honestly, he may just have to go full aggression. This play shuts, shuts oh. that down a lot. Now he's relegated to the kindly grandmother and he's at the mercy of Silent Storm's draw at this point. If Silent Storm picks up some big draws, you're going to see this game come to a, a fairly quick end. Well, this is Neobility saying that he's not relying on burst damage from hand, but because he has that Savannah High Main, the Ragnaros, the Fire Lord, as well as a copy of Stranglethorn Tiger, he's thinking that if he plays it this way, he's more likely to get the damage he needs from that minion combat instead of from something like the Kill Commander Quick Shot from hand. Well, it's ending up in a, in a pretty reasonable situation for Neobility, where he's down a lot of damage, but he does have Ragnaros here, and regardless of which target it hits, I think he's pretty happy about it. So. This particular sequence ended up really well for Neobility because of this Ragnaros in hand. And that's one of the reasons why it's in here is when you get in these tough spots, this card can solo carry a game. Also, now the Hunter doesn't have anything to play on turn eight unless they have oh, a couple of cards in hand. Oh my gosh, Cora, that's... that is a huge draw for Silent Storm. Shuts down the Ragnaros, begins pushing damage. He has Fiery War Axe to keep backing this up. And that Savannah High Main is doing nothing on this board. Silent Storm's got 11 power on board. He's going to add four more to it. And Neobility has no way to check that. It's situations like this where I just sort of sit back and say, Admirable, go for it. Show me how fantastic this was for Silent Storm because there's really no voice like yours that can just say huge draw with that much enthusiasm. And it was absolutely game changing for Silent Storm. The, the, everything is on his side right now. The execute draw is, is weak in this spot and it's still even pretty good. It's not bad. I mean, he, he would have rather had more pressure even here, but with the Cthulhu's chosen down, that's difficult to remove. Don't even bother trading. You're at 26 uh, after this. Just are we sure that the Hunter's the aggressive deck of this one? Silent I mean, Storm is crushing. So that Sylvanas turn honestly was what changed this game because it made that Savannah High Main more awkward for Neobility, and then the Ancient Shield Bearer just cleared it right up. Just fantastic series of draws and I was saying before the hunter is so strong in this matchup but the Cthulhu warrior with that extra bit of armor and that minion pressure can just swing the game around and silent storm with a 4-0 victory over neobility uh, it just what what a fantastic performance and a lot of this did boil down to how strong his draw was with Cthulhu control warrior there is a lot of top end in this deck but it, the high risk high reward style of building from him paid off in spades in this one. He had every tool to dismantle the early game. There was one or two small missteps from Neobility and Silent Storm capitalized. Just absolutely fantastic. Silent Storm is a player who's been on the radar for a very long time. He's had incredible finishes, seven consecutive ladder finishes in the top 30. I mean, that's incredible consistency. And now he is going to the finals with 
the potential to be the last player making it to the World Championships. Just what a stamp on his resume that would be. A player with a, a storied career of consistency. You can't ask for much more than a, than a finalist representative uh, than Silent Storm. Absolutely, and to get a little bit more insight onto that match, here's TJ and Frodan over at the side table.